That was inspiring. Was inspiring. Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> I like how you have the crowd in your hand. They just followed you, everything that you do. I hope you're also very inspired by sitting in a room where it says we train rats to save lives. Which is, Which kind, is of kind of what? what? But okay, okay let's, let's talk, talk about, about that later, later I guess. I guess, I guess. Um, um, I'm, I'm Chris, Chris, and today and I'm going to talk, talk about, about what's next, next because, because that's what happens, happens when you don't send a talk outline. outline. Brian, Brian asked, asked me to talk for this conference, this conference for years and years, and I never had a chance to come because I was booked otherwise. And then I've totally forgot to send a talk outline, so he's like, what's next is your talk right now, so come up with something. Excellent. Um, um, I'm CodePoid Code on, Twitter. on Twitter, that's where, that's where I, do I do most of my life and uh, my uh, social my life because it's kind of sad being a geek. And uh, I've been an HTML5 advocate and developer for uh, since its inception more or less. I worked in Mozilla and Firefox OS, an operating system that's built in HTML5. And uh, now I started working for Microsoft because there's lots of good stuff coming, which I'm going to come back to in a second. Now, what's next? I was asked to talk to you about all the cool stuff, the amazing things of tomorrow, like the Windows holographic Italian gesture simulator that we just created here. And, and I could, and tell, I could you tell you all these cool things, things that are happening, that are happening right, right now that right now in San Francisco, Francisco Google is talking about it, Google I.O. as well. I mean, the big things, of course, are Internet of Things, VR, big data, you have like artificial intelligence, wearables, machine learning, smart cars, we've got smart homes, we've got smart pets, we've got smart politicians. No, sadly enough, not yet. But, but I could have I could told you about, you about all the technology, technology that you're not you're using not yet using and you could should feel, feel bad about, about that you're falling behind because, because there's younger, there's younger guys, guys and more, more, more amazing, amazing guys that make more money than you and have much better things like web components, components which allows, allows you to componentize, componentize the web and have like parts of the page that are independent from another. Service workers which is an HTTP stack in JavaScript that allows you to control the whole HTTP before the page is loaded, which allows you to do proper offline web applications. Uh, ECMAScript 2015-2016, which is the next iteration of JavaScript that gives you classes and promises and iterators and all these cool things in JavaScript itself. Or frameworks like React, Angular and Polymer. Polymer 1.0 just got released. React is quite amazing because you can build native apps and web apps with it. Uh, web VR, uh, VR is like virtual, is virtual reality, reality because reality, reality is too boring, boring so we put a thing on our face, face until we get travel sick from it. From it. Uh, uh, uh. WebGL is 3D rendering on the web, 3D gaming and all kind of uh, 3D environments and also hardware acceleration with that. WebRTC allows you to do one-to-one -one peer communication, video, audio, but also data, which is really good for financial applications and stuff like that. I could also I could tell also you that you're that terribly ineffective and you should embrace new tooling, tooling because, because you, you use, use like old man people, people stuff like, like Apache, Apache and PHP, PHP whereas, whereas people, people use Node or I.O. to, to actually run their servers, servers now. now. So there's, so there's Grunt, Grunt and Gulp that does all kind of task runners for you, all things that you do by hand right now you could automate. You can do remote debugging with DevTools, Vorlon.js is one we just released, Winery. Most developer tools allow you to do remote debugging on devices now. Unit testing, of course, which you probably do, but every Everybody has Everybody to do has that to for every single, single line of JavaScript, JavaScript nowadays, nowadays as well, or you're not a real developer. developer. Package, package management, management npm, NPM installers, installers editor integration sublime, sublime electron visual, visual studio code. code there's a new editor every month that makes you much more effective once you, once you spend the three weeks learning, learning that new editor. editor and of course and there's sas compass and less which is much better than CSS because it gives you lots of confusing things that have not been have not been standardized and are much faster that way the problem, the problem is, is that is I'm actually, actually not, not here, here to confuse you. I'm not I'm here not to here depress you. you. I always, I always I love I these like, like future, future of the web, web talks, talks and I'm like, I have no time to do this. I got like real things like clients that give me money for building them things. And I, I, what, I, what I do now, I fall behind. Oh my God, I'm going to be dead and homeless in two weeks time or homeless first then dead. I'm also not a fortune, not a fortune teller. teller. We're really, really bad, bad as humans, as humans to, to predict the future. Otherwise, we'd just play the lottery and not do work, you know? But every, uh, I, I, I talked to the Danish press yesterday because I was in Denmark for another conference, and he asked me about the future of the web, and I'm like, well, how about you write an article about all the predictions of the future of the web that didn't come? Nobody follows these things up. Every, every big conference, people say, this is the future and it's going to come soon. And nobody, nobody follows up when it hasn't because we're too excited looking after the next thing that might come. I'm getting tired of this. So none of this is usable right now without much overhead. 
I mean, setting up your own server for every HTML page that you're looking at. Service Worker only works when your server is HTTPS as well, so you need to encrypt everything before you can use the thing, which is not every website out there wants to go that way. Some of it will get you confused why this matters, like why should I do this, because what I use right now works, why, what is the real benefit of it? And others get frustrated by your day-to-day -day deliveries, because you come back from a conference, you hear about all the cool stuff, and then you, you meet with the finance, financial institution or insurance company that tells you like, yeah, but we don't do that. We just want to have that interface that we used for the last 15 years, and please don't change it, because otherwise people get confused and we have to send them to trainings and spend money on the people that work for us. Who wants, who wants to do that? I keep calling that the Stockholm, uh, 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 the Stockholm syndrome of interfaces. When you give somebody a really, really bad interface and they have to use it for years, then they start defending it. Instead of just wanting a better one, they're like, no, no, these eight steps with like five drag and drops in between, that's how we do things. Don't change that because it confuses people. And there are great talks out there on the schedule. So no pressure, everybody, everybody will learn something today about web components, about all kind of the cool things that I'm not going to talk about. I'm getting tired of chasing the near future. I'm just getting, I think this is this rat race that the tech press puts on top of us, saying like, you gotta be innovative, you gotta do something new, everything old is bad. And I think we, we could learn from what we've been doing for years and years and just make it better. But we're not going into the make it better phase anymore, we're just going into, ooh, shiny new thing, let's implement that one, because new is always better. And there are so many current problems to solve. I got this message the other day, like, backup failed, success, close. Okay, <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> like, please give me some help. But that's the kind of stuff that we do day to day. The error messaging of the web, the, uh, uh, the, the, the cases when something goes wrong are terrible. The, uh, on the eight, I'm on the eighth floor in the hotel here, and the wireless is going up and down like a roller coaster. It's absolutely terrible. And my computer, the fan is starting, everything is starting to go slowly and sluggishly because every website tries to continuously pull content in the background and doesn't have an error case realizing that there is no connection. Okay, there is a wireless connection, but it doesn't go through the DNS lookup, so it basically is not a connection but a connection. And nobody tests for that stuff. Everybody's just like, oh, if it doesn't work, then to do. If it works, oh, here's my application. So <laughs> we're not really good at, at thinking about the bad cases because we don't want to. So what happened? When did we go from let's build some stuff to oh my god, we're not good enough and it's all terrible? I tell you what happened, mobile happened. Mobile made us confused, like oh my god, now Apple has this beautiful phone that will be the future and nobody's gonna ever touch a keyboard again to write a text. We're all gonna do that with voice recognition because if 10 people in the room talk to their phone at the same time, there's no confusion going on there. I love that when I'm in America and you have like these cubicle offices where people have walls in between them, they think they become invincible and you can't hear them anymore. The amount of private stuff that people say on the phone in a cubicle that you can overhear is just nuts. Whereas like in an open plan office you would never do that. So what, what was the problem with mobile? Native mobile apps are taking over a lot of our former business because they look gorgeous. They, are, they do one thing and one thing well. They're not the cluttered thing that we are used from the web, where it's like, do you want this use case as well? Because it was a plugin and we had to use it. They work offline and have sensible interfaces, like one button to do a thing, and I get the phone out, it's offline, okay, it's still, I can do something with it. They have access to the hardware and its benefits. They actually know the geolocation, they know the accelerometer, they can access the camera without going through 12 steps, do you really want to do that and should you allow this app to access the camera, because they're already there. And it's damn easy to buy stuff in them. iOS is not the most growing and fastest and best platform because it's technically the best one, it's just very easy, easy to spend money on it, because you have to type in a credit card before you use your phone. On the web, you have to ask people for your credit card, then they have to go through the verified by Visa thing, which is an iframe which, uh, with some random domain, and then it tells you forgot that password again, then you forgot the other password, and then you're not buying it. On the iPhone, oh, I bought it. And a lot of people buy it without having the money, but that's another problem. Their problem, not Apple's. So native mobile apps answer a few questions that our clients keep having uh, for years as well. Like, how can I reach people but prevent them from taking my content? That was always my favorite. Like, I'm a photographer, I want to put my photos online, how can I stop people from downloading them? You put them on a memory stick and you leave them in your desk. 
that's the only way you stop people from downloading things because they can take screenshots or they can take a photo or a camera out and take a picture of your screen as well. You go on the web to distribute, you don't go on the web to actually hide. That's not a clever idea. How do I know who's using my product? Can I get their statistics? Every user wants to know how many 35 to 37 year old German guys who are left-handed that live, that sit in front of their screen are using my website right now. And on the mobile web, we have that because everybody has to sign into a social network as well. Might be Google Plus or like Apple. We know who you are. That's why we can sell you many more things. And can my users become advertisers for me? The wonderful share button. Like, okay, you like this app. I mean, how many times do you play a game on mobile app and you, instead of playing the game, you get asked every five seconds to share your, uh, your, your thing with your friends, like what you've done. You're like, no, I don't want to do that. I want to play the game. That's why I downloaded it. Because it's, nobody goes out and says like, finally I can generate content for major brands. Finally I can do some work and other people get money for it. That's be awesome. Personally, I think it's a step back in computing. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not necessarily, I, I understand it, I love my mobile phone, I love, uh, I love some apps that do this stuff for me, like British Airways apps showing me my boarding pass is awesome. But apps are consumables, and they turn software into consumables that are controlled by the publisher and have a use-by date. You cannot sell a second version of a website. People just expect the website to have new functionality over time. But you can charge them for a new version of an application. App makers are dependent on the app store provider. The great thing about the web is like I put it in an FTP on some server and people can connect to it and whatever. Nobody can stop me from putting pictures of myself in a bunny suit on the internet. Apple can say like, no, the bunny suit app of Christian is not good enough for our marketplace, so you're not allowed to publish it. We went back into a world where people tell us what we can publish, whereas the internet was that wonderful revolution that tells you you can publish whatever. Which of course means a lot of people publish terrible things, but a lot of people publish things that are not good enough for mainstream but are super interesting. Users have no chance to change content to their needs, and that's an accessibility problem, and that's a translation problem. The amount of sites that I go to that are not in my language, and then the browser like Chrome tells me, should I translate it for you? Awesome. An app? Well, you have to wait for the German one to get released, because the English one is the only one that is in the market right now. I cannot resize the font in an application. I can do it on a website. That is, to me, all step backs in, uh, in software, and software as a service for users out there. I gave a TED talk about this called Why the Web is Dead, where they, they incarcerated me on a red dot and I couldn't leave it. That was just very annoying. But um, if you want to get more about this, why I think it's a step back in time and it's just making software fashionable, it's a nice talk. In any case, there's no point trying to match with native technologies with web technologies. Because we're playing in a playing field where we get blindfolded and we only have to run in one direction. Mobile platforms are hostile towards web content. Web websites are not allowed to reach the camera, are not allowed to reach the address book, are not allowed to, uh, uh, to store more than five megabyte of storage, are not allowed to access all the NFC and the cool stuff that phones have right now. So when, uh, when, when Apple came out and said like, okay, our Flash is dead and everything is going to be HTML5, I was like, yes, finally somebody gets it. And then they give us the platform where HTML5 is not allowed to do anything useful because it makes too much money to actually have people build native apps for them. There's a hardwired connection between the browser and the operating system, and that's the most stupid thing you can do. That's what Microsoft did in the 1990s, and that's why we all have these websites right now where we have to have a VM on our Mac to actually fill in our taxes or something like that. Because back then, people thought, okay, Internet Explorer 6, the best browser ever, nothing's going to change, let's write only for this browser on this operating system. And then when people needed to upgrade their browser, they needed to upgrade the operating system, which cost money back then, so nobody did it. Same on a mobile device right now, on, a, on an Android device, an Android ICS device. I don't get a new Chrome, I just get the old WebKit that was bundled with the operating system. On iOS, I cannot even install another browser because it's hardwired to WebKit. So Chrome for iOS is just the Chrome, the services of, uh, of Google, but not the rendering engine of Chrome. Even if the users wanted to a better browser, they are not allowed to because it's part of the operating system and it's hardwired to it. Of course, when something like that happens, then people get creative, and if you, um, if you build an app, there's ways around it. But mobile browsers are a total mess. They're like, every time you go and you look at I can, you, can I use.com, which is a great website to find out what's, na what's now available across browsers, the red bits and the yellow bits are always mobile browsers. 
And the problem, of course, is that there's not one mobile browser. When people say, like, oh, I use Chrome on mobile, there's thousands and hundreds of them. Uh, PPK, uh, uh, Peter Paul Koch at quirksmode.org gave a great talk in, uh, in Düsseldorf about this, where he, where he showed just how many different versions of Chrome are on Android alone. Because Google has, of course, their coolest, newest, and, and most shiniest. But then Samsung said, like, you know what? I'm going to fork Android and make my own one and put my own video and audio services on there because everybody wants those. And of course, you want to have three different map providers instead of just one map app. And then they actually put a browser on there that did different things to the Chrome one from, uh, from, uh, from Google itself. And HTC has another one, Sony has another one, and so on and so forth. So you have a real problem that old operating systems on mobile devices have old browsers and don't get updated anymore because they're hardwired and people expect you to get the new operating system. There's one way around that. If you build a, a hybrid app, if you build an HTML app and you want to make sure that you have Android functionality that is modern or that has all the cool new stuff, there is a thing called Crosswalk Project, which is sponsored by Intel and also partly by others. What that one is, is injects a browser, a web view of Chromium into your app uh, over the other one. So your app has its own browser coming with it, which means your app is always 17 meg big, but at the same time it means that you can control the functionality of the browser and you know it's going to work and you don't have to hope that it works. It's a, never, uh, it's a rather clever way of doing it, and I think it's uh, sad that we have to do it, but it's good that if somebody innovated around that. The good thing about it is also that the app market is already changing. Like the tech press tells us that everybody has apps and it's the only thing you make money, and all these, drop, uh, all these companies now have a pop-up saying, like, please download our app after you uh, download our website first. But people download much less apps than they used to. Like, there's a few surveys where people download one or two apps a month because they already have hundreds of apps on their phone that they don't know anymore, and they spend 90% of the day inside Facebook or inside Messenger to chat with their friends over their phone. Game, uh, games are a thing that people use for three months at a time, then they discard it, then they actually don't play it anymore. The amount of, uh, I'm quite sure I can make a survey here and get your phones out and how many of the apps you haven't started in months and months, and they're still on your phone, is staggering. Because we're like, it's consumable. It's like, oh, let's play with it, nah, don't need it anymore. I might need it later. And that's what I like the web for. If I want to convert British pound to Czech uh, money, I just type in how much is five pound in Czech money. I don't want to have the, oh, download the, tra download the, the, uh, the money app that tells me that one. And after 25 meg and asking me for my firstborn and my telephone number and everything, I can type the same thing in. On demand on the web, that already worked. There's a cutthroat price war that makes it unprofitable trying to sell apps. The only apps that make money are, uh, are enterprise apps company internal apps like the SAPs, like the Siemens apps, these kind of things. All the others, you have to be in 99 cent or less, because everybody else is 99 cent and nobody wants to spend money on it. Most of the time, that's, that's fake as well, because it's 99 cent for the game, but then you have to spend so much money inside the game just to make it playable that it turns out to be 15 pound at the end. But if you start with 15 pound, nobody would download your app. And OS upgrades are slowing down as well. Like when Android came out, people upgraded every, every time a new, uh, new operating system came out. Now uh, uh, Android M developer preview just got released yesterday at Google I.O. Android Lollipop that came out at last year's Google I.O. is 10% of the market. 10% after Google told us that everybody will have Lollipop in like two months time after Google I.O. last year. Because people don't upgrade or their phone providers don't give them upgrades for their mobile system because they just want to stay with the one that they're already familiar with now. And, and that is that really, really, really dangerous, dangerous because that's actually a security problem to me as well because ICS doesn't get any security updates any longer, so the next botnet might actually be on mobile phones. And uh, you also got to, uh, I was at the airport in London the other day because my Nexus 5 just died and I'm like, okay, let's, let's do the normal thing and buy a phone because normally I get them from Google to test things on. And I wanted to have a Lollipop phone and like all of them were like uh, older, older Androids. The Lollipop ones were 300 pound more expensive than the others. It's a nice operating system, but not 300 pound worth. So it's dangerous that that goes. And I think right now it's a great time to get ready for the people who are coming back to the web because they're getting annoyed by mobile. So it's a great time for you to rethink about the web, what it can do, and it's a good thing we're at a Joomla conference because you already do. You're already using the web rather than like going like, how can I write a native Joomla app? Nobody does that. Remember PHP GTK when you can build executable files from PHP files and it put the whole PHP core inside your app? That was the biggest Frankenstein thing I ever tried to use. 
Others seem to agree. PPK wrote a good blog post the other day, uh, web versus native, let's concede defeat, that we cannot match native and we should not because it's not what the web is about. Alas, all of this is cool. We can now go to the web and do cool stuff. To me, the current state of the web feels unloved. People just release things, but we stopped putting extra effort in to make it beautiful. People use frameworks like, okay, there's a widget here, widget here, put the thing together, client can log in, client can do their stuff, yay, sell it, charge it. We build solutions with frameworks and systems. We don't build solutions with the core languages of the web, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and what browsers can do anymore. And what's ending up on user screen is in many cases unoptimized and not the main focus. It's more like how is the business logic of my company translated into a website? How easy is it for me to for me to maintain the content of the website rather than like how painful is it for end users to load that website and look at it in different form factors? And it's it's understandable because the web is not the cool thing anymore. When I when the web came out, I was like I worked as a radio journalist back then, and I'm like, oh my god, I can distribute things worldwide without committing a crime and being in the, in the news or without spending lots of money, that's amazing. Uh, Nikola Tesla said it like, we crave for new sensations but soon become indifferent to them. The wonders of yesterday are today common occurrences. The web is old people stuff. The web is not the cool thing anymore. The new kids nowadays have VR, robots, whatever, like drones and uh, IoT kind of stuff. That's okay because it's now there and people use it and people rely on it to be there. Well, uh, it's, it's understandable as well if new kids don't care about the web as much because for them it's water or electricity. When I open the tap, water comes out. I don't want to think where that one comes from. They don't know what offline means. They've never been offline. They just had a SIM card in their phone and it worked. The modern web looks a bit like PowerPoint of old. I found this website the other day and this is what it looked like. And it's just, I don't know what they were trying to do here. It's, it's just, just uh, please, please stop. stop, don't, don't do, do that. that. Like, like, I'm not, I'm what? what? Like, like, okay, okay. Please, please take my take money, money, just I want you to stop. stop. <laughs> like, but this is a lot what the modern web looks like. Like Bootstrap is partly to blame for that when you got all the parallax websites that all look exactly the same, like a massive hero image, three uh, columns, like a few icons, and then made with love at somewhere. You know, like you know, like <laughs> cookie cutter, same things everywhere. It's not that bad, Chris. Come on, stop telling people that it's terrible. But this is Forbes, for example, a few years ago. And the white thing is the content I came for. The rest is what Forbes thinks might be interesting for me or get paid for using it. It's not surprised that people went to native apps. It's no surprise that every single browser now has a reader mode in it that gets rid of all that shit for you and just shows you the main content. How about giving people the main content and getting people excited and giving them what they came for? That's a good idea. People don't like to wait. And that's the biggest problem. Like, this is, this is Star Trek kind of stuff. Like, I can talk to my machine and say, like, set an alarm for five o'clock this morning. I love when people do voice recognition demos and they're like, who's the president of the United States? I always want the phone to answer. If you don't know that, then you're an idiot. Nobody asks this question ever. This is unnecessary. You really want to have contextual stuff happening with you. But people don't like to wait for websites. It's very depressing when you go there and you're like, it's spinning and it's loading and nothing's happening. In general, it's three seconds. It's more or less what people are happy to wait until they, they recognize something's wrong and they start reloading your page. And as we all know, if something goes wrong with the computer, you only press the button 176 times and then it will be better. Because the amount of like, the website is overloaded. Better refresh it to make sure that it comes back again, you know? <laughs> So, so, of course, this is much worse on a mobile phone because this is the thing like, oh my god, this is the future. Why do I have to wait? And why is there a wide screen instead of the British Railways website where I want to get my, my ticket right now? Things that slow us down on the web are several things, but the biggest ones by far is multimedia content, images and videos. You know, when you get like the client and you give them the content management system and you allow them, you, you shave 50 milliseconds off your JavaScript, you make like 40 lines of CSS where it should be 60,000, and then they upload that 7 megabyte JPEG as the background image of the Hello Welcome page. Or they save it as a bitmap file and then wonder why the browser renders it the wrong way around and these kind of things. Fonts are another big one now. The flash of unstyled font is the new flash of unstyled content. The amount of websites that are on a phone that are like seven seconds white and then all the text pops up because it has, it has a special font. 
it's amazing. It's amazing. Just, don't Just don't do that. Do that. Just, Just don't rely, rely on a font. And fonts are all huge. They're, They're binary, binary formats. formats. That's basically, That's basically what they are. What they are. Redirects, Redirects are another big thing. thing. Like, oh, do you really want to go there? No, we send you to another website. No, we send you to another one. That CDN is not the fastest for you. Let's do a few more pings. So when you take the developer tools and you see the HTTP stack going left and right and center just to load one website and some caching, it's amazing how many times that happens. Third-party libraries and scripts, like better put jQuery, uh, YUI, and Dojo in the same page, because we use one widget for each of them, because then we have all of them. It's, it's much better, and it downloads like 500k of JavaScript that you didn't need. Uh, large, code large code blocks, blocks unmaintained CSS, CSS, unused, unused libraries. libraries. The amount of stuff where people maintain CSS, CSS without, without even looking at the original CSS, CSS and just CSS putting lots of important and much more selectors in there, in there is stag staggering. staggering. I did visit Britain.com, which was 120,000 pages in 37 languages or something like that, and uh, 16 different templates, and it was 300 lines of CSS that I've written. When I left the company two months later, it was 7,600 lines of CSS, and I had no idea what they were doing there. And it's and too it's easy, easy to mess up CSS, CSS that, way. that way. Another, Another thing, of course, course, is that we turn the web into a thing that spies on us. We really, really, like, uh, really, really would like to get to know you whether you want it or not. I've got an, uh, an, an add-on called Privacy Badger by the EFF that shows you all the tracking uh, uh, scripts that are on a page that tracks you, where you are, who you are, what computer you use, what's the time of the day, what's your mood, and all kind of things. And, and these all slow all down because that's all that's redirects, redirects again. That's all that's things all that, that you have to get a DNS lookup, find the thing, download, download it, it uh, send it back. It back. So, uh, so all uh, these like all like buttons or the or like uh, here's, here's a commenting a facility, facility that allows you to log in with, with every, every different every social framework, framework out there. there. All of these, first of all, spy on our users, and second of all, slow us down because most of these uh, these logins don't exist anymore. Like when you see these website like login we stumble upon, you're like, what? This is time. Of course, we clutter up the web with the new stuff as well. The new thing right now, how to browse the mobile web, navigate to the site, close a modal pop-up if you can, decline native app offer, close top banner, close bottom banner. The download our app is the new pop-up. And we all have pop-up blockers in browsers because they were really annoying. And with apps, it's even worse. Like, oh, you just downloaded our really slow website with lots of stuff that you didn't know. You probably want to download the 50 meg application after logging into a marketplace, right? Please, please, please do our stuff. No, you're my service provider. I don't, I don't care. I go to, your, uh, to other people or go out and have fun. Despite truckloads of resources and information, we supersize the web. There's so many conferences about web performance. There's so much free content out there about web performance. And the average website is two megabyte big. Two megabyte, it's a web page, not a website. That's the first load web page. The average one is two megabyte and has about 100 HTTP requests. After we told people that every HTTP request kills kittens. Nobody thinks of the kittens. 1.2 meg of images. Most of them will not be visible on the first page or ever needed on the first page and probably are ugly or badly optimized, but we just put them all there. And bandwidth is not free. We always think like, okay, well, we got DSL connections. I've got a four gigabit connection in Sweden, 100, uh, 250 meg in London. Shouldn't be a problem. I was in Albania the other day, and T-Mobile that I'm with in England, EE in England, which got bought by T-Mobile, T-Mobile, whatever, 12 pound for 10 megabyte of data. Or I can spend 90 pound and get 100 megabyte for seven days. Which means that the average website with two megabyte costs me three euro 23 to load. I really, really hope it's worth it, because <laughs> <laughs> that is my money. I'm sorry, no. So frameworks, of course, lead to better solutions. That's why we have these cool frameworks that do all these magical optimization in the background for us, right? That's my gym in London. Um, first, welcome to venue title in curly braces. Welcome to nothing, and welcome to then I finally have the name of the, operating, uh, uh, of the gym. I already had 10 seconds in here. And it still starts loading, and it still loads random stuff. 13.8 seconds to load the page. That's on a 250 meg connection at home. And that welcome to curly curly brace title thing, that would freak out mom and dad users. This would like, oh, I don't know, there's the matrix in my website. What's going on? Can I please call one and one and help me out or something like that? Because this is not the future to me. This is just like making sure that our convenience as developers punishes our end users. Because for us, writing this thing, I think it's Angular, yeah, it is Angular. 
Ride listing in Angular is very, very convenient, but the end result is very, very terrible for end users. Not too terrible, I mean, there's abusive websites, but this is the thing. And okay, okay, desktop, nobody cares about desktop anymore, everybody has a mobile phone, so let's try the thing on the mobile phone, on a Nexus 5 here. Um, Four seconds, Four seconds, I can now I read can the, now footer the footer of the website, of the website instead of any of the content. I get the links, the links that don't that work when I try to tap, tap on them. On them. 12, 12, twelve seconds later, later I started loading, loading the content, content but it's but not it's quite, quite readable, readable yet. yet. Uh, uh, but, but it started, it started loading more and more, and, more, and then it and starts then it resizing, resizing the thing again, again, I think, in some time. time. In any case, 23 seconds in, 24 seconds in, I have the website. That's not optimization. That's not a good experience. That is just wasting my time. There's a great tool called web uh, uh, webpagetest.org. What you do on webpagetest.org, it's sponsored by millions of companies, so they have a lot of money to get this working. You go and you type in a URL of a website, like jnbeyond.org, for example, now. You select a location of the server that you want to test from. So in this case, I looked around and I said, like, oh, there's actually one in Prague, so that might be the best way of looking at, at it. So I select the Prague server, I select the browser that I want to test with, and then, and then I select, I select the speed the that I want to test, test with, because sometimes, sometimes it's really, really important to test on slow speeds because you find a lot of bugs that you don't have on the fast speed. And then it and starts, then it waiting, starts and waiting, and then when you're finished, it gives you a detailed report about what's going on with your website. What was loaded when, how fast was it, uh, the first view, the repeat view, everything that is an F up there means you messed up and you should fix it somehow. And you click on it and it tells you why it's a problem and what to do with the issue, where you can optimize, what problems failed, so you have full insight into what's going on. You also have a video, the videos that I showed you about my gym were generated with this website. So you actually see the experience on a slower connection, on a mobile phone connection. So if you have a client that doesn't want to optimize their website or doesn't want to have something new, show them some of these videos and then show them how much money people lose just by trying to read their website in time. Not Jane Beyond, that was actually fast enough. And I think we could take a few tricks from mobile and to speed up the web. Uh, one, of uh, one of the thing, thing is, is HTML5 has, has all, all the tools, tools for that. For that. They, work. they work. They they're, they're in the browser. browser they're they're available. They're available for you. For you. Local, local caching of resources. Local, local storage, storage index DB. Every, every mobile app does, does that. that. Hardly any website does that. Why not? Why not? You got five, five megabyte, megabyte to play with. There's a five megabyte that don't have to be loaded from your server every single time the same user comes back to this website. These are coming really really fast from their hard drive directly into your thing. Caching fonts, fonts in local, in local storage, storage is a super, super, super good idea, idea because you don't want to download the font every single time. You just have it on the machine then. Offline functionality. App cache allows you to make an, app, uh, an online app that just loads most of the HTML and you just load the content that you need to do afterwards. On-demand loading, match media versus media queries. Media queries are great for responsive design. So you make like a smaller thing, a bigger thing, show people more when the screen is bigger, show people less when the screen is small. But most people forget that you'd still load everything for the big screen on the small screen when they only can see 10% of the stuff that they loaded. Uh, match media in JavaScript does exactly the same thing that media queries does, but then loads on demand. So you can check like, is the screen big enough to load that content? No, then I don't load it. Fair enough instead of just telling my user to upgrade or buy a phone or something. Progressive rendering of fonts, start with a font that is on the machine, Helvetica, Arial, Geneva, Times New Roman, whatever, that you know is on the machine, and then load your fancy font on top of it so people don't look at 10 seconds of white screen, which is depressing. This is something I wrote of, uh, quite some while ago as a nice demo for that. It's, um, oh, my sound is on. Um, um, it's a website, website that allows, that allows you to allows generate, generate uh, thumbnails. thumbnails. So what you do is, this is an offline website that works now locally on my machine here. You drag and drop image into it, and it creates a zip file from all these image images of thumbnails of the images. So if you now double click on that, then you see that thumbnails of these images have been created. So if I click on that one, I see that it's a smaller image than before. All on the client, no server involved. This is all in the browser itself. So you can create zip files and you can manipulate images in the client right now without having to do anything. How many times did you write a Joomla thing where people have to upload a lot of files and you have to upload them one by one because old browsers and all kind of stuff? The images are also in Canvas here, directly live in the browser. You can change the quality and you can change the look and feel of the image 
Nothing again is an Ajax call in the background or something like that. That all works even offline on the computer if you wanted to. So this way I can set the background color of the thumbnail differently. This color picker is nothing I had to write with JavaScript. It's just an input type color and the browser gives me this color picker automatically. The JPEG quality can be changed directly on the machine as well because all I had to do is with, with a canvas I can get the create canvas to image and I said JPEG as the format and then I give it a 1 to 0 uh, quality of the, uh, of the thing. And you can create the size and whatever. A drag and drop into the browser means you have full file access to these things. And that works across browsers. That's a very, very good way to save your users from having to upload a lot of things in, in 10 different steps. And yeah, you can get that on GitHub as well. It's open source if you want to try it out. And I just, I just did it for myself as a tooling as well. So it's also responsive. So if you resize, the, um, if you resize it to a smaller size, you just have it as a, as a thing next to your finder that you can drag images in and create thumbnails without, uh, without actually caring about the outcome. It's a very nice way of showing what can be done nowadays in computers. But the problem when I show people that and get very excited about HTML5 and all the cool things that we have, the number one reason I got from web developers not embracing HTML5, we need to support Internet Explorer. And I understand it. I, we all suffered from that. I had uh, many, many shouting matches with my screen about why don't you do that. But we need to support Internet Explorer is not an excuse any longer for lazy, bloated, or bad code. And that's why I'm at Microsoft, because of Project Spartan. Project Spartan is the product name of the new browser called Microsoft Edge. This one is going to be the out-of-the-box browser on Windows 10, desktop, mobile, and Xbox. So you don't need to care about this. This is our end users will have that thing. And our end users will have it across the platforms, on the phone, on Xbox, and whatever. It's constantly upgraded. It's an evergreen browser, so it's not the problem anymore that you need to buy a new Windows to get a better browser. It's excellent standards on ES6 support, and it's fully hardware accelerated. If you want to try it out now, go to dev.modern.ie slash tools. Dev.modern.ie is the website where you find all about it. Um, if you have a Windows machine, you can actually uh, install it. If you have a no, like I, I'm, I'm on my Mac, uh, which is my company Mac, actually. Microsoft gave me a Mac. Weird. Um, you get virtual machines where you can just double click on it and fire up a Windows 10 machine that has all everything pre-installed for you and you can try it out. There's a site scan and generate screenshots. You can test against the virtual browser that's going on there. But that's about it. It's coming. This is the next browser and it will be the same functionality as Chrome and Firefox and Opera and all these cool browsers out there on desktop. Of course, the ones on mobile are to have the name but not the functionality. So. I don't care if you, if you get excited about it. I just wanted to make sure that this excuse of saying, like, I cannot use modern technology because I use Windows is going away. And it is going away now. But make things work for every browser out there. The biggest mistake we make right now is that people get as excited about Chrome as we got about Internet Explorer 6. And we see people find these websites. You need Chrome to use this. No, nope. you need me as a customer. This is what you do. You need me as a customer. Your job is to make me happy, not me change my computer or change my environment to, to look at your website. This is what floppy disks are about. This is what CD-ROMs are about. The web is meant to be, uh, uh, meant to be adapting to my needs as an end user, not me as adapting to your website. The web can't be better if you repeat old mistakes. Uh, don't actually say, uh, you need Chrome for this, because people then go away and like, I need, your, I need your competitor for that instead. There's a website called browserhacks.com, which gives you all the tricks how to target a certain browser if that, that browser has one problem. And I quoted on it, well, no, don't. Because let's give up on that crap. If it's five, seconds, uh, five pixels wrong on Internet Explorer 8, who cares? As long as that thing works, that's what people are coming from. People who have to use old Internet Explorers in their company are not used to beauty. Don't confuse them. Don't give them things that look shiny and creative. Give them something that works, that's what they came for. Don't overload them with lots of animation and JavaScript libraries that don't do anything for them. 
it's it's time to give up on that thing like called uh, pixel perfect in every browser. That was never a possibility. If a web program, if a web product is pixel perfect across different environments and in different form factors, you've made a mistake. You've put something stagnant on the web. You put something on the web that is not living and not changing for the end user. This is not what the web is about. It's not about pixel perfection. It's about giving people the right interface at the right moment in the right environment. And all our all our technologies are flexible enough to do that. Check back frequently on Baron Interop. Statusmodern.ie shows you all the things that are supported right now, SMJS, audio tracks, and so on and so forth. And you can check across all the other browsers, telling you which one is the one that uh, also supports it. So if that's green on all the browsers, go nuts. Use that thing. It's for you. We put this in browsers for you, rather than just for ourselves. Because that was what the old XHTML was about. There's not a single player or winner of the web. Changes every month. Always new browsers, always new environments. You don't even know some environments. I've seen mobile phones and mobile phone operating system in China that I was completely confused about. What is that thing? But they like up. 80 million people use that. Uh, OK, so probably I should support it or find out what's going on there. But it's not one browser, one environment. I find it actually despicable that most web developers have a Mac and think the whole world uses Macs as well. They don't. They have Windows machines, they have Linux machines, they have old whatever machines, OS2 Warp, Amigas, Commodore 64s. They're all allowed on the web. Nobody should tell me I need to have buy, a, buy a Mac to be a web developer. Read up-to-date information and learn instead of copy and pasting. Developer.mozilla.org is the open uh, uh, documentation of the web. I'm still writing for that one, although I work for Microsoft now, because they don't care. And uh, uh, that's where people find stuff. Don't go to W3 schools. It will, you will lose hair. It's bad for your teeth. It's, uh, you get sick from it uh, the more you use it. Because uh, W3 schools gives you the answer, but not the why. It gives you the like, oh, do it like this. And you're like, oh, cool, now I know it. And then when it's broken again, you're like, oh, I don't know it either anymore. So MDN explains you the how and the why, and that's a very hard job to write. HTML and CSS are designed to be fault tolerant. If something just goes wrong, CSS and HTML say meh and move to the next line. So this is a great example. Data list is an HTML5 element that allows you to have a autocomplete on an input element. So in this case, source, if I start typing in a browser T, it will show me television as an option immediately. So you have like a compo box in JavaScript that we used to have in Flash and wanted to have in, in HTML for years and years. Now, if a browser does not support data list, we just put a select element around it. So you have a select box, and then you say, if other, please specify, you have the input element here. Now, if the browser supports data list, this select element and that text is illegal. Well, not like going to court illegal or something like that, but the browser says, like, this is not HTML, I'm not going to render that. So it doesn't even show it. So that way, you make it work for old browsers and for new browsers at the same time, and you don't have to spend these 400 lines of JavaScript into an autocomplete control because the browser does it for you. And you can even load the content of that select element uh, uh, dynamically with AJAX or whatever you want to have. So when a browser release, uh, not support in a browser is a benefit. It's not a stopgap. It's like, as this browser doesn't support select inside data list, I can give select only to the older browser that doesn't understand data list. It, need, it needs a bit of thinking, but it's a wonderful uh, term investment. JavaScript, on the other hand, is not fault tolerant. So if you make everything depend on JavaScript, one single error, and the page looks like this, and your end users start drooling and start calling your bad names and these kind of things. Because with XHTML, we said it's too strict. The web, one XML error, and the website would not show up. That's why we needed HTML5. Now we make everything dependent on JavaScript. We have the same problem again. Capability testing in JavaScript means that you never deliver broken experiences. And that's as easy as saying, like, if thing, thing, do thing. That if statement is the most important bit. It means that you actually test for the thing before you use it. It's like jumping in the river after checking that it's deep enough and there's no crocodiles in there. Probably a good idea. And I just gave a talk about progressive enhancement, which gives all about that. So if you want to look, up, look more into that. 
The BBC uh, has a script called cutting the mustard, which is a very British term, and it just says like, if query selector in document, local storage in window, and add event listener in window, then the browser is good enough for JavaScript functionality. Then they lazy load the rest of the JavaScript rather than putting all the JavaScript in and the browser cannot do anything with it. That one saves you from having to test in old browsers because you don't give them any JavaScript at all. There's no way it can break because it just get, doesn't get applied. Uh, Jake Archibald found that on mobile even better with not visibility state in document and return. That one blocks out all Internet Explorer 10 and Android WebKit because Android WebKit is the antichrist. Let's not, let's not talk around, uh, be around the bush here. It's a terrible, terrible browser. And that one allows you then to, ca to cater more as well. You say, like, if visibility state, we've got a modern browser. If service worker, then we can make it work offline as well. You can nest those if statements, and they're much, much better than putting lots of shims and libraries in there that you hope work in the browser. And that's the power of the web to me. Supply only what is needed, not everything you want to put in the page. Don't do the Forbes thing where you show people everything on this planet and hope that people click more links. They come with a purpose, they leave with a purpose. Give them what they need to do and they're going to have a happy experience and tell other people how amazing you are. Enhance only on demand. Like, if it's possible for the browser to do this, then do that. The, uh, the thumbnail generator thing that I showed you, that one is just an input type uh, fi a file. Extend it. So if the if JavaScript is not available or the browser doesn't have any of the canvas functionality, I have a PHP script that does the same thing. So you put the images there and you get them back as just images in PHP. Fair enough. Pull, cache, and use. Take as much content as you can when while people are using their website. Cache it for next time when they come so they don't have to load that from the web again. My favorite example is forms. Everybody hates filling out forms, but we never use that time. How about on the first focus element on the page, when people click in the first thing, you do a lot of loading in the background because you know the user's going to be 10, 15 seconds filling in that form. These are ti this is time that you can use for preloading the next things that are coming rather than having for them to wait for it. React to change without having to publish and deliver a full new binary. This is the great thing of the web, because on, on iOS, oh, I forgot something in my app. Well, repackage it, send it off, wait two weeks for Apple to say, yes, that's okay again, and then you can publish your app again. On the web, you can hotfix and uh, make changes really, really quickly, and that's wonderful. There's a new There's thing a new now thing in, in PhoneGap. Yeah. PhoneGap yeah. allows you to take hy uh, to create hybrid apps, to take HTML5 apps and turn them into native apps. There's a thing called Content Sync now, which allows you to upload, uh, to load a zip file in a running app in iOS and Android and replace part of the application. So we have the same functionality that we have on the web with the hotfixes, now in native applications using Content Sync. We have Facebook to thank for that because Facebook native needs that functionality as well, or React native needs that functionality as well. And when Facebook goes to Apple, Apple says, yes, if I go to Apple, please, eh, what do you want? But this is cool, because this means you can even create native applications from your HTML, uh, uh, Joomla pages or whatever, that can be updated uh, after they've been installed, rather than having to wait for the two-week period that Apple says yes or no any longer. And this is going to be a big, big change. So what's next? I don't know. It's a richer, based on a a richer web based on agreed standards. Internet Explorer is dead. Only people who really need it for systems that have been necessarily built only for Internet Explorer 8 can still have it, but every new user in the last platform that made us say like HTML is not available, HTML5 is not available, is now has a browser that will do the thing. So please make a beautiful, rich web for users out there because they deserve it. We have the same freedom of publication and distribution we have now. Like, why should I be at the beck and call of Apple or Google to publish something? I'm a publisher. I'm intelligent. Uh, people want to see what I do. I should have the right to do it. And there's many different form factors. And uh, I mean, there's VR coming. There's like uh, uh, augmented reality. The headset, the holographic headset that Microsoft is building is running Windows applications as well, which are HTML5 applications. All these new form factors will come, and the web will be the one to support them because it's the only one that can adapt. When you read the origin of the species, uh, the survival of the fittest thing has always been misquoted. It's not the strongest, it's not the biggest, it's not the most powerful animal, but it's the one that's the most adaptive that will survive. And the web is the most adaptive, pl adaptive platform for you to support out there. And with that, I'm done. Thank you.